I would like to present to you Kendra Tierney of Catholic All Year. Thank you all so much for being here and for the love and prayers with which you have so generously supported me and my family for the past months and years. Um, I'll get into a little bit more uh, detail on that here in a bit, um, but I hope each of you knows how real and important that has been for us. Um, so we're just gonna have kind of a winding little chat, informal-like, um, if you guys don't mind. I have a couple points that I'd like to make today that I think are in keeping with our general theme of resilience and, and our patroness, who uh, this year is, as you know, Our Lady of Perpetual Help. So, um, start off with, we have sort of a running family joke that we get recognized by one person everywhere. When, <laughs> when our whole family is out at a national park or an amusement park or at mass somewhere on the road, usually someone will recognize us and come up to say hi. And I think it's great, really. I mean, we're rather a spectacle when we're all out together, no matter what. <laughs> so uh, it's nice to be getting some of that attention for <laughs> uh, Catholics who have been following our families ups and downs since before many of the kids were born. Um, so, but sometimes that will beg the question from the kids as to whether I am famous. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have to explain about fish and ponds and all that. And, say that I am a very tiny bit famous among a small and very nice group of like-minded folks. Um, but it does, it, it does make one reflect on the idea of celebrity, and, and especially Catholic celebrity. Because what does that word mean, celebrity? It means to be celebrated, to be held up as a noteworthy example of something. And the problem with that for Catholics is that we already have an established system for that already, right? We have a long-standing method by which we determine which Catholics are to be celebrated and held up as an example, and it's called the canonization process. <laughs> and importantly, no one is admitted to that process while still living. A Catholic celebrity is always going to be a bit of a liability for us. Um, someone still living can mess up, can get something wrong, can let us down. All right, so the word that's banding about on social media is influencer, right? And I guess as cringy as that can sound, it actually does feel a little bit more appropriate to me, a little bit more accurate, because there are Catholics that I follow on social media, and there are Catholics that I know in real life who influence my worldview and my perspective of the faith. And that seems fine, good even, as long as we keep the right perspective. But for me personally, the angle that I, have, uh, that I prefer is subject matter expert. You know, like, like on the 24-hour news networks, when some world event happens or there's a particular book or movie is all the rage and all of a sudden there's a demand for someone who knows everything there is to know about Borneo or 17th century sewing techniques or like that indigenous sport with the hips and the peach baskets. For whatever reason, now we have questions for that person, right? So that's how I've always tried to approach my books and my social media as a subject matter expert. Catholic faith and loves the saints and Catholic history and tradition and obscure customs and who wants to share that information. So it seems appropriate when somebody messages me to ask if there's any recipes associated with a particular upcoming feast day or when folks start leaving comments asking if it's going to be a meat Friday or when a friend texts me a photo of a saint statue she found at a thrift shop to see if I can figure out who it is based on its little attributes. <laughs> I love that sort of thing. I've spent a decade working on gaining very niche knowledge for moments just like those. <laughs> so when I give a fiat talk, what I want is to give you some answers. I want to give you like five easy tips for getting your kids to say the rosary or eat their vegetables. <laughs> I want to be a resource for you. I want to be a subject matter expert. But then this summer, my situation changed. My husband of 21 years passed away peacefully in our home after a 16 year, old year uh, battle with melanoma skin cancer that eventually metastasized to his brain. So all of a sudden, I had all these people watching me, not for my, not for my tips, <laughs> but for a different reason. I had new people watching me, thousands and thousands of new people on social media. 
And they were still good Catholic people, <coughs> people who had been praying for us, but also I'm sure people who were curious about what happens to a family when they lose someone. <sighs> people who were curious about what life looks like for a widow with many children. And I'm still not quite sure what to do with those people. Um, honestly, the most comforting thing anyone said to me over those first couple weeks was my friend Hope, who told me, you know, people look to you to see what Catholic life looks like, and most people never see this part. You shared with people what a sacramental Catholic death looks like, and I really appreciated that perspective on it, and I'm deep, deeply grateful that I listened to that nudge of the Holy Spirit um, on, on that one, to go ahead and open our home when it seemed like the end was near. American culture sees death as a hidden private matter, but that's not at all how, how Catholic culture sees it. But then, you know, that, that part is over, and now it's me and my new life, and I'm not a subject matter expert on any of this. And every new TV show I start features what I now call the VSW for Very Sad Widow. <laughs> this character was in all the TV shows that I tried to watch this summer. She is a recent widow who is very sad and can't function or care for herself or her home and basically abandons her children because she is so heartbroken. And it wasn't very heartening <laughs> to me to find that this was the expectation that Hollywood, at least, had of me and my prospects. Um, Michaela mentioned at the beginning of, of the conference that we chose Our Lady of Perpetual Help as our patroness because we knew that I was likely facing a challenging year. And I wanted to invite speakers who knew what it was to overcome adversity. And I wanted to hear those stories and know that it was possible to hold tight to the cross and to keep the faith. So what am I gonna talk to you guys about today? It took me a long time to figure it out, but I'm fortunate enough to have good friends and to have had good conversations. And they, some of the, some things just kept coming up again and again in these conversations. So. They helped me sort of sort some things out. So this still probably isn't going to turn into a real talk. We're just going to have my side of those conversations while I stand up here. <laughs> um, I want to share a couple of those uh, of things about which I feel I've gained some understanding through the process of living with Jim's illness and that uncertainty and with loss and widowhood. The first is a strategy that served me well throughout the long years since Jim's diagnosis and to which I've still had recourse over these more recent weeks since his death. In some ways, it was my St. Paul on the road to Damascus moment. It came to me undeserved in a flash, and it really changed my perspective. It's useful for big life-changing events, but it's also helpful in little everyday moments. It came about on the day that Jim was diagnosed with, with melanoma, originating in a mole on his back. First, it was just a malignant mole. Eventually, we learned that the cancer had spread to his lymphatic system. He underwent a course of treatment, and it appeared that he was in rem remission for nearly 10 years. Uh, but we later found out that the cancer was back, or more likely that it had never really been gone. And at that point, it spread to his lungs and eventually his brain. But on that day, it was just a melanoma tumor in a mole. So I went to go pick up my oldest son from his little neighborhood preschool that he attended. And when his teacher asked me, how the day was going, I told her, <laughs> uh, which, looking back, was definitely an awkward choice. <laughs> we, were not, <laughs> we were not close friends or anything, but that's what happened. She says, hi, Mrs. Tierney, how's your day going? And I say, well, my husband was just diagnosed with cancer. <laughs> Fun, right? Um, but she rolls with it. She says, wow, you must be really worried. A reasonable thing to say, polite. But I remember it like it had one of those tire screeching cartoon sound effects. I must be really worried. Somehow that turn of phrase really hit me, must, as in it is required of me to be really worried. And in that moment, I was infused with supernatural grace and or my contrary little self just rebelled against the thought that the universe was gonna tell me what to do. So <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> so I told her, you know, I've decided that I'm going to wait to work. Because really, in that moment, things were fine. My husband was well. He wasn't experiencing any pain or any symptoms. I was well. Maybe later it would make sense to worry. I was going to give myself permission for that should it become necessary. But on that day, it didn't seem like I needed to worry, so I didn't. 
I don't think I had yet made Padre Pio's acquaintance, so I wouldn't have yet known his quote, pray, hope, and don't worry. It's really good advice, but I'm not sure that in that moment I would have been ready for that kind of commitment. I couldn't promise that I was never going to worry. It just seemed like I could manage to not worry today. The first real challenge to my new policy came three days later when I learned that I was pregnant with baby number four. There are a lot of what ifs available to a pregnant lady, right? But still, I stuck with the plan. I decided that today, again, seemed okay. Today, I didn't need to worry, I would wait. And against all odds, after 16 years and six more children and surgeries and seizures and hospitalizations and eventually hospice and death, each day on that day, it has been okay. I've been able to wait. I didn't need to be really worried that day. I think when we look at it honestly, that teacher was unintentionally giving me very bad advice. <laughs> she was telling me that my only choice was despair. Despair is a sin, and worry in my case would have been just another way of describing despair. Despair is a turning away from hope, and hope is the virtue opposite to despair. Hope says that I trust that no matter what happens in my life, no matter my circumstances, God is good. On the day that I found out that Jim had cancer, we were okay. I could trust. I could hope. I could believe that God had a plan for me. I could, at the very least, wait to worry. And on the day that Jim died, the same was true. On that day, we were okay. I was surrounded by friends and family. Jim had received last rites. He had made a good confession with our friend, Father Matt. It was the last conversation that he had. He had said yes when our pastor, Father Gonzalez, asked him if he wanted to receive the Eucharist. It was the last word that he spoke and the last food that he ate. Um, I was surrounded by consolations, I was covered in prayer, and on that day also, I could wait to worry. And since then, each day, it has been the same. It has sucked in many ways, <laughs> don't get me wrong, uh, but each day in itself has been okay. I've joked that the movie version of my life is gonna have the lamest ever inspirational montage sequence uh, consisting of me making phone calls and finding important documents and <laughs> filling out paperwork and figuring out how to scan paperwork <laughs> and miraculously having one more stamp. <laughs> Super exciting stuff, you guys. <laughs> but, but it's also been not being a VSW, spending time with friends and trying to be there for my kids, praying, participating in the sacraments believing that God still has a plan for me and my life, allowing myself to see that today is okay. Today, I don't need to worry. I can still wait. Uh, I'm doing okay. I have not dissolved into VSW status. The kids are doing okay. Waiting to worry is working for all of us. But then one might reasonably ask, why would such a thing work? How is it possible that I've been able to wait to worry even though the thing that I was waiting to worry about went ahead and happened. And that is the other topic I wanted to talk about today. I believe that the main reason that I have been able to keep up hope and trust and to avoid worry and despair is what Michaela was just talking about, intercessory prayer. And most of you have been responsible for part of that prayer, so thank you. Um, while the distinction between types of prayer is really academic and all are interrelated, Catholics recognize five different general types of prayer. We call them worship, praise, thanksgiving, petition, and intercession. <laughs> worship exalts the greatness of God and focuses on our dependence upon him. Praise gives God glory for God's own sake. Thanksgiving is being grateful for the gifts that God has given us. Petition is asking God for what we need, or at least what we think we need. And intercession is when we ask God for something for someone else. And I know that people all over the world have been praying for my family for a decade. <clears throat> and now I would like to pause to tell you about my favorite children's book. And anybody who's read my blog posts about uh, Michaelmas knows that I, I always recommend this one. So it's called The Bear Skinner. It's an adaptation of a Grimm's fairy tale in which 
a soldier returns from war to find his town destroyed and his family gone, and so he makes a deal with the devil. It's a great book for kids. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the deal is that for seven years, he must wear a bear skin, and his pockets will be full of the devil's gold. He can spend the money, but he cannot tell anyone why he wears the bear skin. He cannot pray, and he cannot kill himself. If he does, his soul will belong to the devil. But if he does not, at the end of seven years, he'll get to lose the bear skin and keep the pockets full of gold. So at first, of course, he has a grand old time spending the money. But soon, the bear skin begins to rot, and he becomes isolated, and he begins to lose hope. He begins to despair. One day, he has the idea that he can give his money to the poor and ask them to pray for him. There's a beautiful illustration in the book, and if I was a person who knew where books were in her house, I would show it to you right now. But, <laughs> but as it is, you'll have to imagine it, but I, I believe in you. You can do it. All right, so in the illustration, the bearskinner, he's wearing the rotting bearskin, and he's walking along the river, and he's tempted by its churning waters, and the prayers of the poor are these white butterflies shielding him from darkness and keeping his despair at bay. And that's really how I see intercessory prayer. And I'm standing here as a witness to the fact that prayers are not always answered in the way that we would like. And it's not because we didn't have enough faith or because we didn't pray in just the right way or because not quite enough people liked and shared the posts on Facebook. <laughs> it might just be that it was not God's will. I, I don't have to understand it, but if I'm willing to submit my will to his will, I can accept it. We have to remember that there must be a caveat attached to every prayer, spoken or unspoken, and that is, Lord, if it is your will, dot, dot, dot. Anytime we ask God for something that we think we want, we must remember that we only want it if God wants it. We must remember that God is not bound by our prayers. The goal of prayer isn't to change God. The goal of prayer is to change us. And again, I cannot claim to be an expert on that, but I'm going to keep on, keep it on. I'm gonna continue to hope and trust, and I'm gonna continue to wait to worry, and I'm gonna continue to rely on intercessory prayer, so please keep it up. Thank you.